I want to talk to you about a little transition that we had here um, in the spring as I introduced um, Matt Smith to you. Um, as, as many of you know, and, and I know many of you in the room have uh, seen, uh, uh, we had uh, uh, Dr. Larry Snyder, who was the uh, director of our computer science and cybersecurity programs. He, he was on TV an awful lot for us. He uh, helped us to start the original masters in uh, cybersecurity management. Um, he got the uh, program off the ground in cybersecurity over in our online program at the American Women's College, which is just growing like crazy. Um, and it's nice to have that program online because we can reach far beyond this region. And then he also helped us to get the undergraduate program in cyber uh, started here, both in digital forensics and information assurance. Um, just an incredible talent and just a great guy. And now he is down at the University of Bloomberg in Pennsylvania with 28 other cyber geeks trying to make a difference in this world. And we're just really happy for him. And we're so pleased of what he did for us while he was here. And I did want to uh, acknowledge that. So how do you fill those shoes, OK? How do you do that? And that's the uh, beginning of my introduction here to Matt Smith. And I'm going to embarrass him a little bit, I'm sure, but I think that's the right thing to do when you're trying to help people understand why they can have some confidence. Matt has just an incredible background. Um, he uh, started out over 20 years ago in the US Navy and uh, spent six years in the Navy with the Navy Security Group uh, in San Diego and then also with the Electronic Warfare Center in Ottawa, Canada. And uh, a lot of that was involving uh, satellites. So uh, I'm sure that uh, you could call him a registered spook, um, at least the early part of his career. So he worked in information assurance in the early part of his career. And then he went to General Dynamics, a defense cyber uh, crime center in, uh, in Maryland. And uh, that's a big place. If you haven't, uh, if you understand cy uh, cyber, what's going on, it's amazing that he was there. He developed the ex extensive experience in all facets of computer forensics and security, became an NCASE certified examiner for general dynamics representing the DOD Cyber Crime Center. He developed expertise in e-discovery, fraud, incident response, major crimes, counterintelligence, counterterrorism, and imaging. Noted as an expert by the federal courts in computer forensic analysis for court testimony. If that weren't enough, he goes on to EMC Dell in Hopkinton. He joined EMC as a principal forensics engineer in support of their corporate uh, general counsel and global security. Noted by the federal courts as an expert in computer forensic analysis for court testimony. And responsible for managing all classified incident handling at EMC. Not bad. Then he comes to Mass Mutual Financial in Springfield, provides subject matter expertise to the enterprise in digital forensics and incident handling with primary customers, supported incident management and uh, incident handling teams for um, uh, rapid response and management of crises uh, level cybersecurity and data loss incidents. Then we post a position over at the American Women's College a little over a year ago uh, that we were expanding, growing so fast that we needed to have a full-time person over there to, to manage the cyber program at the American Women's College, and he applies for that position, okay? With that background, we were very excited about that. So then when Larry left and we posted the position and he applied for it, we were very, very thankful to have that depth on our bench. So I want you to jo uh, uh, join me in welcoming Matt to the stage and to the organization. Come on up. Matt is responsible for all of our computer science our, and uh, the uh, cybersecurity programs for the graduate programs and undergraduate programs at Talk and also here in the Longmont campus. Matt, welcome aboard. Thank you. I'm a little short, so I'm going to narrow this down a little bit. Thank you, Dr. Loper, President Larry, distinguished guests, and for all of you that took time out of your day to come to the summit. I appreciate it, thank you. Well, as Dr. Leary mentioned, I was fortunate enough last week to meet the governor of Massachusetts, Mr. Charlie Baker. And I was also fortunate to get unique one-on-one -on -one time with the gentleman uh, and talk about cybersecurity. So having a lot to say to the gentleman, uh, my first thing that I uh, came out of my mouth was, was governor. Well, actually, it was more like governor. <laughs> You're really tall. <laughs> so and I do have that, that snap it. <laughs> or I'm really short. Either way. <laughs> but to get back to it, at the Mass Mutual Cybersecurity Forum, the governor stated that there are over 9,000 jobs in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that are unfulfilled right now in cybersecurity. 9,000. That's pretty, pretty deep. 
Following that up is the uh, Secretary Ash from the um, Economic and Housing Development, and he states that there's an estimated 350,000 open jobs currently across the United States, 350,000. He further goes into that the estimation is going to be 3.5 million globally by 2021. Now the reason why that number is important is because us in the industry, the experts, we've all been looking at 1.8 million for the last three years. It's almost nearly double. So we have to really look at what's going on here and how to fix this. What does this all mean? Well, we need more women and we need more men educated and trained in cybersecurity. It's really that simple, but as you can all imagine, it's not that easy. We need academic institutions to establish robust cybersecurity programs. And to do this, we all have to understand that we cannot do this alone. We need to collaborate and partner with all branches of our country's workforce, such industries as financial services, healthcare, government, and technology, to name a few. And this is what we have in this room today. If you look around, all these industries are represented currently as we speak. And as you network before and after this event, you'll notice that. This is why we host this annual summit, for all of us to collaborate, listen, and learn from one another so that we can reverse this trend at these unfulfilled vacancies across large and small companies and across local, state, and federal jurisdictions. Now we at Baypath are thrilled to provide our students with the opportunity to, have cutting, to use cutting edge forensic software along with meeting industry experts. We are fortunate to have three industry experts uh, sitting in front of us that are gonna be on this panel today. Our first speaker is quite impressive. He stepped in to assist the FBI during the Boston Marathon bombing and provided his expertise and his digital forensic software to aid in the investigation. Prior to his current position, he was leading the IT security department at a small company called Apple. So that's pretty impressive. <laughs> his digital forensic software is known throughout the industry for its robust investigative platform. And we are proud to partner with him for the last three years here at Baypath University. Mainly to that gentleman, Mr. Jim Scripture, our lead faculty and professor in forensics. He brought this partnership and it's aided our students tremendously, providing them real world experience using real forensic software to jump right into the workforce and start day one. I am privileged to introduce all the way from San Jose, California, co-founder and chief scientist at Black Bag Technologies, I give you Mr. Derek Donnelly. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Good. Uh, I tend to move around a lot. I grew up in Quebec, Canada, and uh, spoke French a lot, so I tend to talk with my hands a lot and move around. So hopefully you can keep up with me. Um, when I was working on this presentation the last couple of days, I kept on thinking, what, what was I going to call it? And uh, I wanted to give you a bit of a sense of sort of dealing with forensics and specifically de dealing with forensics, dealing with Apple devices. And uh, uh, yesterday I ended up calling it the, the trouble with, with apples. And it's a direct reference to, hopefully, some of you may remember, 
um, the trouble with tribbles. Uh, another great Canadian, William Shatner from Montreal, Canada, uh, famous for the uh, dramatic pause. And um, uh, he was, he had a, 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 this was a really interesting episode about um, basically the Tribbles, those little furry things, uh, taking over the ship and basically almost crashing it. Uh, and I sometimes compare this a little bit to iPhones because they're furry, they're nice and cute, everyone wants one. Uh, they don't look dangerous, but sometimes they are, and sometimes they can crash the entire ship. Um, so the idea was to kind of give you an idea of so dealing with forensics and dealing with iPhones. So how many people have an iPhone? So take a look around the room. Would you have thought this you know, maybe 10 years ago or 20 years ago? So when I started at Apple, I started in 1998. Um, two days after I started, Steve Jobs introduced the iMac for the first time. And Apple was supposed to be on the brink of bankruptcy and everything like this, and now it happens to be a little bit bigger company, right? Um, and, um, but it's also been really interesting because a lot of people have these devices, iPads, iPhones, watches, laptops, um, and it, it's made a huge sort of impact on the world. And it's also been very interesting and challenging dealing with these devices, especially when it comes to doing our forensics. As I noticed up front on the logo, there's Carpe Diem. Our, lo our logo at Black Bag is Carpe Datum, seize the data. <laughs> um, and we have another saying too that is Discus Duris Nacrium Mentator. So for those of you who know Latin, it means hard drives never lie. People lie, hard drives never lie. So the idea is to, to give you a bit of a, an, an introduction to this, we're going to get a little geeky. I will not get too geeky. It will be just like ripping off a Band-Aid. Um, but the idea is to tell you about some of the things that uh, are, have been issues. And a lot of this sort of leads to some of the aspects that you probably heard a couple of years back, San Bernardino, the San Bernardino shooting. There was kind of a big standoff between the FBI and Apple. And um, a lot of issues regarding privacy and getting into these devices and dealing with security and dealing with um, a crime and trying to get into this data. And a lot of people were you know, very upset with what was going on. And uh, I want to sort of expand a little bit about, uh, uh, on that today. So to give you a little bit of background, I was a federal law enforcement officer in Canada for five years, basically a geek, and then I was a geek with a badge. Um, and I worked for the Competition Bureau, which is the equivalent to the Federal Trade Commission here in the, in the U US. So I started as an IT person about a, six months after joining, they said, you're becoming a federal law enforcement officer. I said, OK. Uh, so I did my basic training, and then I went to the Canadian Police College and learned how to do computer forensics. So we had search and seizure powers. We had the capability of searching you know, documents going into file cabinets, things like that but we want to form a unit that would specialize in digital forensics, uh, which was very, you know, a very big piece. It was an upcoming piece. Obviously, there was companies have computers all over the place, and we had to have people that had to be able to deal with this data, uh, laptops, desktops, servers, things like that. So after going to the police college and learning how to do computer forensics, uh, very quickly I started specializing on the Mac side. Uh, close to academia, my dad was an academic dean in a, in a sage up, up in Quebec, and they were one of the first colleges to bring in Macs on a large scale. Um, and so I was always a Mac guy, and then I ended up working for the federal government, and then basically uh, get a badge, and now I'm a federal law enforcement officer, and I'm specializing in digital forensics. Interesting. I start working on a bunch of cases. I work very closely with the Royal Canadian Mount of Police. And then I start working with different agencies in the US. I went to a conference in Austin, Texas in 1996 and basically started meeting with people from the FBI, Secret Service, DOD, intelligence agencies. I became an instructor for the FBI. And I was on loan from my agency to the FBI. So one week out of a month, I was either doing training or working on cases. I worked on the African Embassy bombing case, famous case out of New York, five suspects in New York. They all had Macs. To this day, I still don't know what I found. Everything was in Arabic. Um, but uh, they ended up getting indicted, and uh, 
Uh, it was a very successful case. Um, it was an interesting case because, again, I couldn't read Arabic. And um, he had to search for all these uh, keywords, which was lots of squigglies, and try to translate that to ASCII. I did something like 4,000 screenshots, and it was sent back and forth to a translator. And to this day, I still don't know what I found, but uh, it was interesting. And ultimately, I did find some aspects of how they were getting into the country and things like that. So I was on loan for di uh, to uh, the different agencies. Um, and I also worked on another little case, kind of famous. It was a little intern that got into a lot of trouble at the White House. But we'll talk about that later. Anyways, so during that time, working with all these different agencies, um, and then uh, the FBI suggests, hey, we're going to Apple. We're going to uh, Macworld. It's a big conference in San Francisco. We want you to come. We want you to make introductions for us. We'll pay for everything. You just make your way to San Francisco. And uh, at that point, um, I was potentially thinking about leaving the agency I was working for. Part of it because they were going to get rid of the Macs. And when the Macs were gone, I was going to be gone. So um, we go to San Francisco. I talked to a recruiter at Apple. Um, they, you know, I was really interested in maybe a, an IT position or something like that. They mentioned something like, is your name Derek Donnelly? And I was like, why? Um, and then they said, we've been wanting to talk to you. So at that point, I was basically recruited by Apple, and I headed up IT security for Apple for five years. How that came about, I'm still not quite sure. I still think the FBI had something to do with passing on my name to them, and I was going to be the inside man at, at Apple. But uh, it was interesting. And I did forensics on Steve Jobs' computer, and I'm still alive today to talk about it. So I was also responsible for Steve Jobs' security at home, at work, and I'm still alive to talk about. We'll talk about some of those stories later on. Uh, so during that time at Apple, uh, Apple was very, imp uh, produ uh, very, um, um, they're, they're very, very careful of their intellectual property. So I worked on just about every imaginable case you could think about. And initially, they kind of said, your forensic stuff is interesting, but I don't think we're going to use it that much. Towards the end, it was all I was doing. It was basically forensics. Um, and then, um, and then Steve got to know me, which was a little scary. And to this day, at 3 AM, if the phone rings, my wife will say, it's Steve. He's found a way to communicate again. So, <laughs> um, so during that time, working for Steve, was, it was a little scary. Uh, interesting. Um, a lot of people asked me, was he really you know, that scary? And, and I always shake my head and go, well, let's talk about another subject, right? But during that time, it was, it was a fascinating time at Apple because Mac OS X was coming out, so the, the operating system you see today, uh, for almost a year, we were dealing with it before it came out. And then, towards the end of my career there, I was actually just starting to deal with some of the first prototypes of the, of the, uh, of the iPhone. So, during all this time, I started really specializing in computer forensics, specifically Mac forensics, and then later on, iOS forensics. And it's interesting because a lot of time people start, start talking about cybercrime. And ultimately, today, it's just crime. It's just another facet of crime, right? Because ultimately, at some point, your computer, an iPhone, something is probably going to be involved in a crime scene and such. And um, you know, just about everyone has a phone uh, and, and an iPad. We had an interesting discussion yesterday about that first uh, that first national emergency notification that was sent out. So imagine sending that out to like 75% of the country. I keep on thinking it might be an interesting way, some way to do a census, right? Send out a mass message to everyone and start figuring out how many people are in the, are in the country. But it's, you know, it tells us how much these devices are sort of changing our lives. Um, so when it came to dealing with Apple devices, Law enforcement tends to get really nervous because a lot of them have experience dealing with forensics and specifically dealing with Windows forensics, but then they get really nervous about dealing with Macs. Part of it is because it is a different file system um, and it's a different operating system. So uh, they're pretty secure. Uh, we see less viruses. They make up a smaller percentage of the market, but there's still a large, much larger percentage when it comes to iOS devices or the iPhone. They can be more expensive, user-friendly, 
uh, a lot of people are very loyal to the brand. They tend to just work, as Apple used to say and Steve would say. And, um, but they can also be very difficult to get into. And a lot of it is, no, it's not Windows, right? It is a, a Mac. It's a different operating system. And it's a different file system. A different kernel, different file system, different chips. And again, um, investigators going from the FBI to federal, state, and local agencies get nervous about dealing with them because they have a lot of experience with Windows. And then maybe one out of 10 cases is, is a Mac case or an iOS case. Uh, Jim will attest to this. When we were uh, working at the, at the Bureau and doing training, um, you know, there was a smaller group of the entire FBI group that would do Mac, Mac forensics. And it was a specialty. Now it's kind of changed a bit. It's become a sort of cross-platform. But at the time, there was more specialized people sort of dealing on the Mac side. Uh, but there's a lot of famous cases involving Macs, um, including um, uh, Boston Marathon involving iOS and Macs and such. So, um, and the thing too, when you talk about investigators, at some point they're going to have to testify. There's a good chance they're going to have to testify. And this is where people can use software, but sometimes they get very nervous about that final step. If you have to go testify, you don't want to look like an idiot on the stand. And someone's going to potentially cross-examine you, and potentially a defense expert is going to go after you, go after you go after your credentials, and basically ask you what you really know about a Mac. And that's where, again, investigators tend to get really, really nervous about that. And that's where we spend a lot of time developing software, training law enforcement agencies, and sort of dealing with um, these devices and giving them good experience and good uh, background so that they can testify. Because part of doing forensics, you have to find the evidence but you also have to explain the story of how it got there. It's not just a question. Unfortunately, a lot, of, a lot of these cases of all child pornography, things like that, you can't just find the images. You have to explain the story and explain that someone had intent to get that content on their system. So, and to explain intent, you have to basically explain the story. How did it get there? Who was responsible for that laptop? Who was running it? So now you have situations where you got people that have iPhones and iPads and, and laptops and potentially committing crimes uh, using a, a variety of different, different means. And then you got these devices that tend to be a smaller percentage of the market, but tend to cause, uh, uh, you know, it can be used in all kinds of crimes. So when it comes to dealing with Apple, one of the things that's also dip difficult is Apple's putting their own chip now in the iPhone. So they, instead of like an Intel chip or an AMD chip or something like that, they, they actually have their own chip. And there's referred to the A4 chip, the A12 chip. Now they have the A12 Bionic chip. Um, and they even have their own uh, chip, the T2 chip for security, reference to a Terminator 2. Um, so there's still a, a lot of research that needs to be done dealing with this chip because it's not, it's widely used in the iOS devices but it's not necessarily widely used in the rest of the, of the market. Specifically talking about the T2 chip, it's also been interesting because this is a security chip that's now part of the devices that Apple has put in. So on top of having their own uh, kernel and having their own operating system, they also have added their own security chip called the T2 chip. And this is causing all kinds of issues just in the latest hardware. It's the iMac that came out just before Christmas, the new laptops have a T2 chip. And on top of it, by default, uh, Apple's turning on encryption. So it makes it more difficult to boot this device up from, let's say, an external device. It gets more difficult to actually image the internal drive. We'll talk a little bit about imaging after this. There's also, Apple has this sort of secure enclave. So when, you, when Apple sort of talks about its security, the enclave is basically almost a separate um, uh, processor that boots up and it, hel it helps you to basically, it's, it's almost a computer within a computer specifically just handling security. It's a separate processor that handles the encryption keys and biometrics, it has its own microkernel. And when you talk about people sort of going after exploits of these devices, this is kind of the holy grail what people go after. People are trying to get into this secure enclave. And, and when, when you get into these devices, they're difficult to get into. If you don't have the password, you're probably going to have a hard time getting into that device. 
So it tends to be um, easier to root Android devices. What rooting means basically get into the full access to the file system, access to all the files. So Android is very open source, whereas Apple's not very open source. Uh, and you, you can, people can research the um, low-level commands used in Android, but you can't do the same thing in the, uh, on a Mac. Um, when it comes to rooting, or sometimes people refer to them as jailbreaking, when you basically remove all that security and get down at the lowest level of that phone, get access to the full file system, get access to, uh, to uh, basically every single file, uh, but Apple tries very hard to make sure you can't do that. So the example San Bernardino, when they were trying to get into that phone, they didn't have the password. And then the, uh, the FBI was potentially asking Apple to assist them to get access to that password, and Apple said, no, we're not going to do that. Um, so getting into these devices is really, really difficult. And the people do research to potentially go after exploits. They can be worth millions, these exploits. And some of them t tend to be sold to the, to the Chinese or other countries. Uh, re exploit research can be very, very lucrative. Um, so they can be sold for millions. And you probably heard of other countries that have potentially been paid for some of these exploits. And some of the exploits have been here used uh, by the US government and such to get into these devices. Um, and Apple actually has a, a bug bounty program, but there's other people willing to pay more than what Apple's doing. So uh, it becomes um, interesting to get into some of these devices. I love some of these screenshots. These, this is great security, right? Uh, don't tell anyone to pin, right? And uh, you've got a, a gold-plated sign above, the, of, above it, right? So a lot of times, when we're getting, trying to get into these devices, we're actually trying to basically figure out what that pin is or what that password is. Now, a lot of people tend to use the same pin they use for their ATM, right? And I'm going to have a little conversation at the end of this presentation about you should be changing that pin and be changing that password. It's always interesting sort of dealing with both sides of this. I'm a big security person, but I'm also getting into forensics and getting deep into your device. And um, also, forensics tends to be sort of the last step of sort of cybersecurity gone very wrong, because now you're spending a lot of time basically looking at how someone potentially got into a device. But forensics also helps us to learn how that potentially happened. And potentially, forensics also helps us to sort of figure out how we can secure that device, uh, even if it's not even involved in a crime. The other tricky part about dealing with the Apple devices is there's more and more encryption going on. Basically, the iOS device, the phone that you have, if you have a, an iPhone, almost all the files are encrypted. So on top of potentially trying to get to the file system, the files themselves, the individual files are actually encrypted. And now with the T2 chip, this new security chip, the encryption's on by default. So if you bought one of Apple's new laptops, even if you haven't turned on File Vault, File Vault is basically a built-in mechanism to secure the system. Even if you haven't turned it on, the encryption is on by default. So this is giving a heartache to a lot of people, and people are getting very nervous about this. Law enforcement are particularly getting nervous about it. And the T2 chip ties, talks directly to the hard drive, which also makes it very interesting. The other aspect that's also going on is that more and more data is ending up in the cloud. You hear this all the time. People are you know, putting stuff in the cloud. But Apple basically, by default, when your phone, if you, when you first set up that user password and that account, if you kind of go with the defaults, a lot of your data is going to end up on Apple servers, which is a good thing and a bad thing depending who you are. right? So let's say you are a crook, and suppose you've been using an iPhone, and you, you, know, you, you had a feeling something was going to happen. Federal agents break down your door, and the, the night before you decide to wipe your phone or you threw your phone in the lake. Well, now it's possible to potentially still get a lot of that data from Apple. So even though Apple's not really assisting people to get into the device, they have made the process a little bit easier to get data from their servers. We'll talk a little bit about that further. But basically, a lot of people sort of don't realize if you kind of go with the defaults, a lot of your data ends up on Apple servers. And people are a little confused by that because Apple sort of makes it so easy. Set up your account, put in a password, everything will be great. But now data is ending up on your server. The good news about that is you get a new iPhone, 
or you upgrade to a new iPhone, you put in, and then put in that same user ID and password, and boom, all the pictures of the kids are back on your phone. But how did that happen? The data ended up in the cloud. The data, the data ended up on Apple servers. So yes, it's easier to upgrade. Yes, it's easier to share this data amongst the, all these different devices, but um, it is also giving us a place where we can look for evidence and help us to potentially find passwords, find artifacts of, of different applications that may have been used where the data is going into the cloud. And if someone has purposely tried to, let's say, destroy their phone, it gives us an opportunity to potentially go after the data. Um, recently, we assisted in a case in Iowa. You probably heard of the Molly Tibbetts case, right? So at that phone, they, they, didn't, know, uh, they didn't know where the phone was, but they were able to get some data from um, uh, uh, doing search warrants to Apple. Um, so it can potentially be easier for Apple to provide data to law enforcement when it comes from their servers. It's an automated process as opposed to someone shipping a phone to Apple, they're trying to unlock it and send it back. Very early on in some of the first phones, this was happening. But after time, Apple sort of realized this is not going to work well. And then there's, there's obviously a lot of PR issues. The other aspect of sort of dealing with phones is that there's millions of apps, right? There's thousands and thousands of apps. They're all storing the data in different ways. A lot of the apps are written with Coco or Xcode and such, but you've got millions of apps out there. And trying to parse all this data becomes really, really interesting because every developer might be storing the data a little bit differently. They might be encrypting stuff. They might be putting stuff in the cloud. So um, it's very, very difficult to parse all this data from all these different apps. And these social media apps that are coming out all the time, there's, there's new ones that are in favor you know, almost monthly now. And um, there, there tends to be uh, a lot of social communication apps that are used around the world. Uh, and law enforcement is potentially trying to get into those. They're trying to get, if you've got a case, you're basically trying to get into Snapchat or some of these apps that are specifically doing it in a way where they make it very, very difficult for law enforcement to get into them. So you got thousands and thousands of apps out there. The data sometimes in the app itself can be encrypted, usually referred to as a sandbox. Um, and this is actually potentially a great opportunity for artificial intelligence to come in and do some analysis, where you're, you're dealing with thousands of apps and you've got all kinds of uh, different formats of data. Until, uh, artificial intelligence, and there's a lot of work being done in this uh, by the government, to potentially say, profile all those apps that you find and go find the nuggets of information. You gotta realize there's an amazing amount of data on a phone. And a lot of people sort of tend to think of their music, their videos, their pictures, but there's can thousands and thousands of files that sit on that phone. And on top of sort of dealing with all that data or a laptop, you can have 300,000 files that's just the operating system. You haven't even looked at a user created file yet. So when there's tools that can come in and potentially help you to look at all this data and potentially standardize, it becomes really, really important. Another thing is messages. Instant messaging is big. People, uh, do, people do a lot of SMS, iMessage and such. Even in the last version of the operating system, there's a new feature in iOS 12 where basically it's messages in the cloud, where it becomes really interesting because now they're purposely make it very easy for your messages to be on all your different devices, but to do that, they're actually adding more encryption uh, to do this and creating a specific container for uh, your messages in the cloud. So I've already just been dealing with that, with that just in the last couple of months where Apple has changed something again, and now we've got law enforcement are, are scrambling to try to figure out how to get into this data. So there is some good news. Um, an iPhone is very much like a, a small Mac, right? It's a, a very similar operating system, very similar artifacts, similar apps. Uh, file, file system is the same. Uh, there's a brand new file system called uh, APFS. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, apps are potentially created in Xcode. So the more you know about a Mac laptop, you're in a much better position about knowing how to deal with an iPhone. So it, it can, uh, when you come to, when you're doing training or you're learning how to do forensics, the more you learn about dealing with a Mac, which is a lot easier to get into than an iPhone, you're in a much better position to deal with an iPhone later on. 
um, so Apple, as I mentioned before, um, so they're not helping you to get into the device, but they are doing an Apple search warrant process where law enforcement can do a search warrant to Apple, and they will basically provide you the data that's on their servers. But there's a big caveat. They hand over the raw files, and they hand over the encryption keys, but the files are left encrypted. So Apple basically says, you can, we'll get these files to you, but we're not doing the decryption. And mere mortals have a lot of problems sort of dealing with that de decryption process. It's complicated. There's lots of different uh, forms of the encryption, uh, depending on what device, what OS was used. So they now provide you the keys, but law enforcement has to do that decryption. We've done a lot of work with this. And uh, over the last year or so, we have a process now we're putting it into our main tool, but we have it as a service. So there's been people have done the search warrant process but I've been very frustrated because they get all these files from Apple, but then they, they don't, they're only seeing maybe 20% of the data. And they don't realize some of the data is actually still encrypted. And then some people do realize the data is encrypted, but they have no solution to deal with it. So it's good from the standpoint that, let's say you can't get into the device, Apple will at least tell you what is sitting on their servers. And because of all that syncing is going on, a lot of data ends up there, and it's, it's quite surprising what will end up on those servers. Um, a lot of law enforcement don't even realize they can actually do this Apple search warrant process and get this data. And compared to some of the software and tools out there, it's basically a free process from the standpoint you get someone to write up a search warrant, you get a, a, you get a, a judge to sign off on it, and then you start getting this data from Apple. I know this screenshot is probably a little bit difficult to look at, but basically this is what the raw data looks like from Apple. Long series of, of file names. It's really complicated to deal with it. And we take all that, this big gobbledygook, and turn it into uh, basically a true file system. The real file names, the files are decrypted. And at that point, you can start to see the SMS messages. You can start to see the pictures and things like that. There's this whole other aspect of international borders. What do you do when you're not in the United States, right? Uh, it's been interesting because Apple's also been sort of helping when it comes to exigent circumstances. So if you can basically prove that someone is about to die uh, or is in grave danger, Apple will speed up this process, which is good. Because um, if you're in another country, let's say the UK, and you've got someone that's being held in a basement against their will, and potentially they could potentially die in the next 24 hours, uh, if you can prove that, Apple will speed up this process. You have to understand that when you come in from the UK and ask data from, normally from Apple, you have to go through an MLAT, the multilateral treaty process, which can take about six months, which wouldn't be very, very good for our victim. So sort of dealing with when you can potentially prove exigent circumstances, Apple's actually been turning around some of this data in 24, 48 hours. Um, and it's been helping in quite a few cases. Um, so, and the other thing that's interesting about the international borders is that you potentially have um, data, Apple data, that's also sitting in other countries. Economic Union, there's stuff sitting in Ireland, stuff sitting in the UK, France. Um, so that's, it's, it's caused issues, but Apple's been a little bit more responsive when it comes to getting into this data a little bit faster. Even though they're not really helping you to get into the device. So if you can prove exigent form, uh, circumstances, there's basically a two-page form you fill out. And at that point, you can potentially get the, uh, the, the data in about 48 hours or less. Um, so that's been a good thing when it comes to getting into devices. For those of you in forensics, you may have heard of a solution called GrayKey from a company called GrayShift. It's been it made quite a big splash at the beginning of the summer some new hardware that was basically getting, allowing you to get into an iPhone, even if it was password protected. Uh, it made quite a big splash. They uh, presented at a, a few conf conferences uh, at the beginning of summer. We partner with them. We work very closely with them. They're good at extraction. We're very good at the analysis. Once you get all these files, getting it out and getting it into, into the data. Um, Elias, it's, this has given an, an opportunity for law enforcement to get back into these devices. You have to sort of realize when it comes to law enforcement, over the last year and a half or so, there's been a lot of iPhones sitting in evidence that have never been touched because people can't get into them. 
so when the great key solution came out, it, it made a big difference, but it's also an expensive solution. So it starts around 15,000 a year. It's for law enforcement only. It's only available to the, the five eyes. So basically US, Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and the UK. It's not available to the private sector, um, but it can break the pin and extract the entire file system. Um, and then Apple had a response to that. Um, so there, there's things like password cracking, getting into the iOS device. Um, a lot of these tools are actually using that exploit to get into it and then basically try the passwords. Now, Apple has not made it easy to get into these passwords. Basically, think of the password as being a hash of the password 10,000 times. If you're familiar with hashing, it's basically a, a, a cryptographic process. So it makes it basically difficult to guess passwords because you basically can do one or two guesses a second. Where in the password, they say they try to crack a password and throw a big dictionary at it and try all these passwords. Because it's, there's a lot of hashing going on, you get one or two attempts per second. That's horrible when it comes to doing password breaking because think of how many seconds you have in a day. That's potentially how many attempts you're getting to potentially break the password. That's where they look at potentially spreading it out amongst multiple systems, multiple laptops, multiple uh, systems on a network and such. So when the gray key stuff came out, Apple had a response to it. They basically limited it to uh, the USB connection to basically one hour. So that made things difficult. Um, so basically law enforcement, even if they had the gray key, and let's say they took a, a, a phone from a suspect, they basically had a one hour window where they had to get that iPhone to a device as quickly as possible before that one hour would run out. Um, uh, but some hacks have been found about that, and it, 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 has, uh, it's, it, it has helped a lot with some of the older devices, and is still helping with a lot of the current devices today. Now, I'm a geek, and uh, one of the things I got terribly excited about is uh, a brand new file system. So Apple uh, replaced um, the um, older file system called HFS with APFS. Um, the, the older file system was showing its age, and this gave us basically all kinds of new places to potentially look for data, look for evidence, look for those artifacts. So um, why did Apple need a new file system? It was basically showing its age. They wanted to become a, a more modern file, file system, so it had a lot of improved performance. It had support for encryption, uh, versioning backups, all this basically adds up to, it makes it really exciting to do forensics because you have a brand new file system that is now being used, and a lot of people didn't know how to deal with this file system. Apple didn't release the information about this just less than a week ago. For almost a year, the specification was, out, was not out there, so everyone was basically reverse engineering it. So during that time, we spent a lot of time reverse engineering it, and you start to see APFS on all these different file systems. There's also a new image format. You may, the pictures you have on your iPhone, you may have JPEGs or PNGs. Apple came out with a, a format that came from licensing from Nokia called HEIC or HEIF. So basically, uh, a, a more compressible file for an image with a better resolution. Mojave's Apple's a, a new file system, lots of new features, but also a big emphasis on this new file system, APFS. Um, when it comes to the operating system, uh, to the hardware themselves, Apple is also using a different type of hard drive. Apple's kind of famous for, for using proprietary technology and, uh, and incorporating it into their tools. So now they have this brand new hard drive, which has a, it's a non, it's a non uh, industry standard connection. Um, and it also talks directly to this T2 chip. And the encryption is on by default, as I mentioned before. Uh, this is causing lots of issues because even if the user hasn't turned on encryption, it is on by default. Uh, so it potentially makes imaging a hard drive, typically that process of acquiring the data from a, an iPhone or, or from a laptop, more difficult. This T2 chip has gone into the new iMac, new laptops. On top of having the encryption on by default, we can't boot it externally like we used to and we, um, it's going to potentially be more difficult to actually uh, look at that device. iOS 12, the new version of the operating system, 
uh, for the iPhone, messages in the cloud, it also has APFS. Fusion, so sort of the, sorry, geeky aspect of potentially dealing with the drives, Fusion is a combination of potentially having a solid state drive and potentially a spin drive, and it's a hybrid of both drives together, and also it's using APFS. When you get into forensics, we talk a lot about dealing with memory analysis. Um, because we're dealing with hard drives, but we also want to look at the live memory that's sitting on this system. So live memory, uh, people have been doing this on Windows for quite a while. It's starting to happen more and more on the Mac. Um, and this is a place where you can potentially find passwords and you can potentially find encryption keys and things like that. Uh, so dumping memory from a live system like an iOS is a very, very difficult process and people are really, really interested in that. It's also really good for malware analysis and potentially trying to figure out if a, if a device has been compromised. So traditional imaging may actually be dead. So in the past where people would image an entire drive, let's say it had a million sectors, you'd copy every single sector of that hard drive and you start doing analysis. Because of all this encryption and these proprietary drives, and uh, going on, it potentially becomes more difficult, and now we're looking more at doing logical acquisitions of the data. Instead of making this full forensic image, we're looking at getting the active files as opposed to making an image of the entire drive. We're also dealing with huge drives. Two terabyte drives are pretty much now the standard. So when you've got a big drive and people, fills, people filled up that laptop with a lot of data, you have to look through potentially millions of files to potentially find those great nuggets of information. So the forensic impl implement, uh, implications of all this, potentially two experts could be looking at the same data, especially when it comes to this new file system. And because we have this brand new file system that's still very new, and a lot of people don't know what's going on yet with the file system, you could have two experts that could come up with very, very different results when they do analysis. So it's interesting when it comes to dealing with a brand new file system, a little scary because now we can potentially find evidence in new places that have never been used before. And um, we potentially have many generations of data that might be sitting there. There's also a lot of cases where they refer to as data bleeding, where maybe the file was deleted, but there's references to that file all over the file system. So it might be easier to potentially prove a certain file may have existed on, on a file system at some point. With all this syncing of data between all these devices, the, the other thing that becomes really interesting is data origination. You're trying to prove which device actually created the picture because there's all this syncing going on. You know, your iPad may have a picture that was taken from your iPhone that also synced up to your laptop. So you, now you've made this data duplicated all over the place and you're potentially trying to prove which device actually created the actual offending content. So uh, it, it becomes difficult sort of dealing with all this data, but it's also getting interesting because tools like AI tools and such like that can come in and really help us with this. So it's sort of finishing up in a bit of a review, the APFS file system is a brand new file system from Apple. It kind of changes the landscape when it de we're dealing with all this data. It has some new features that allow us to do snapshots and cloning and things like that. We have a lot of encryption going on in, in uh, uh, some of this new hardware. Um, it's going to potentially be more difficult to recover files that are deleted. You often hear this in forensics, oh, we got the deleted file. Well, now potentially it's going to be a little bit more difficult to get that. Um, iOS, is, it's difficult to root these devices. Lots of data going into the cloud, and you potentially have to start thinking about more a logical collection of the files. And Derek needs a life and stop worrying about file systems, right? I'll leave you with this final thought about passwords. And uh, a lot of people sort of think about their passwords and what, you know, these passwords are potentially used all over the place. And passwords have to potentially be protected just the way as, as you protect a lot of your other data. Um, and when it comes to sort of the, those passwords and those pins you're going to potentially be using, if anything you sort of remember from this conference, uh, maybe from this presentation today, is maybe change it and make sure it's not the same one you've been using for the last couple of years. Because at some point, uh, someone um, 
Um, and I'm not saying law enforcement, potentially hackers, but then you're going to get into your system at some point because you're using the same password all over the place. Um, so to finish up, when it comes to forensics, and the people are studying forensics right now, it's, you know, there's, a, as you mentioned, there's a lot of jobs in this space. It's a fascinating area right now because there is so much change going on monthly, daily, and such. And when it comes to sort of dealing with all these devices, um, as I mentioned before, you're potentially trying to find the evidence and tell that story. Um, and tell the story of how the data got there. Um, and there's a lot of law enforcement hiring people. There's a lot of private sector people hiring people. And we're dealing with all these devices. We're sh sharing all this data. But at some point, there's going to be situations where we potentially have to look at this data and we have to um, get into this data. So it's, it's, it's a great time to still very, very much get involved in this because there's, um, there's people looking for specialists in this area all the time. And, um, and if you do want to go the route of potentially going into law enforcement, on top of it, you potentially have an opportunity to um, get involved and potentially help on a specific case where there's, there's people that have been uh, hurt or there's victims. And, and getting into the forensics gets fascinating because you can look into some amazing data. So I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank uh, Baypath for inviting me to present and inviting and uh, thank uh, Jim for inviting me to present. I hope you learned something from it. And uh, uh, we, we are going to be working very hard to continue our partnership with Baypath when it comes to training new people and getting them involved in forensics because it's a fascinating area. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Derek. That was incredible. I want to just uh, thank Derek for not only for this wonderful presentation, but also for the fact that we are using uh, the software from Black Bag in all of our training programs. Thanks to his relationship, 20-year relationship with uh, Jim Scripture, um, we have we're using we have all of their software or most of their software on our on our servers, and our students are graduating with this capability, and I know that several of you are sitting here who have gotten wonderful jobs in digital forensics right out of school, and uh, a lot of it's because you have that, uh, that great opportunity to, to go through that, learn that software. Um, next, I want to introduce uh, Margaret Weikert. Margaret is our Deputy Director for Management in the OMB. Now, Margaret is incredible. She has, uh, I, I said in the very beginning, um, I said in the very beginning of, of the session that we had uh, four entrepreneurs. When you hear folks speaking today, uh, they've started companies. All, everybody has started a company, started an organization, or turned it around. Mm -hmm. So they're very entrepreneurial in addition to be very technically savvy. Now, what we have for our next two speakers, they're also government employees now, but they haven't been before. This is their first time as government employees, and it's really important to understand that. So for those of you who are understand, want to understand what kind of change might be coming our way, to listen carefully to the folks that are about to speak, um, and I'm going to cut back a little bit on the, on the introduction just so that um, uh, Margaret can have extra time. But I do want you to know that, Pat, uh, uh, that Margaret, in addition to have an incredible experience of Bank America and First Data Corporation, Anderson Consulting. Um, she also has 14 patents. She's, uh, she's quite the entrepreneur. Started her own companies, sold her own companies, merged companies. Um, so we, this is the person who is in charge, deputy in charge of the Office of the Management and Budget. It's, that's all the budget in the federal government. So Margaret, not the best introduction, but I want to give you more time to speak. So thanks so much for having me here today. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, a lot of you might be wondering, why is there someone from the federal government here uh, at a cyber conference in Western Massachusetts? Well, it's not because I liked skiing at Jiminy Peak when I was a, a kid, um, or just because my dear friend Mellicent um, 
uh, is, it was talking about the great things that Bay Path University does for young women in, in the community to really bring uh, talented individuals to much needed skill areas. Um, it's actually because we're having a lot of dialogues across the country about how we link education with the mission that we have as, as a country. And to illustrate that, I'm going to ask you guys a question. Who has interacted with the federal government today? Raise your hand. OK, I'm going to ask a, a, a different question. Who used a map today? OK, keep, keep your hands up. OK, so you, who uh, used some other form of GPS today? Who looked at the weather today? You all interacted with the federal government today. If you have a student loan, if you drove on a road that's governed by um, transit, if you weren't hit by a drone, all of those things <laughs> have something to do with what we're doing in the federal government. And what's really important is my job is kind of a, it, it's one of these jobs like wah, 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 like Deputy Director for Management Office of the Management and Budget, like what does that actually mean? I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the United States. I'm responsible for HR, IT, including information security. Uh, the Office of the Federal CIO, Suzette's office, uh, is under me, but also finance and accounting, financial statements of the government, um, uh, procurement for the government, uh, the people and the workforce of the government, about four million human beings uh, work for the federal government um, directly, and about 10 million other human beings work as contractors to the federal government. And when it comes to cyber, a huge amount of the training for how we keep our country safe is tightly linked to cyber. Homeland security is now critically connected to cyber. You know, we have someone here from Facebook. You see in the news how state actors are attacking our country. And the front lines of those attacks are not just in Afghanistan or Iraq. They're here in hospitals and schools and on federal government computers. And if you think about my workforce, we've got 4 million feds, and then we've got 10 million government contractors, and they all probably have, on average, three devices. And that's before you get into any major systems equations. So we have urgency in the federal government around cyber issues, internal to government, but also as how we inform the broader ecosystem around cyber. And you'll hear a lot from Suzette about what we're doing with the broader ecosystem as well as what we're doing to secure our own systems. But one of the reasons I was most excited to come here today is as I talk to the, the people in our workforce and talk to people around the country about what we do in the federal government, what I'm talking about isn't all the noisy politics that dominant dominate CNN. It's about the things I mentioned when you raised your hand. The people who keep NOAA data feeding your phones with information about how chilly it was going to be out today. The people who put satellites in the air so we have GPS systems that everything from maps to my Pokemon Go app all access. And by the way, all of that fuels American innovation American job growth, and all of the things that, that you get to do every day so that you don't have to think about your federal government. And, and the war for talent across the board in every aspect of American life is real, and it's absolutely critical. It's in the red zone when it comes to cyber. We've got millions of jobs open in IT that we can't fill. We've got a very tight labor market that is making it very difficult for us to get the people on the front lines of defending our nation at home and abroad 
from the type of cyber attacks that we're, we're being faced with. And so in the federal government, we're spending a lot of time looking at how do we partner with academia, state and local governments, and the private sector in order to help deal with the talent gaps that we have around IT broadly, but cyber specifically. And we're looking at how do we reskill our own workforce because we know we can't, there aren't enough people graduating from programs with the skills that we need. So we need to, to, to help educate our own people. And I'm actually super thrilled about some of the programs I'm learning about here, including the SOUL program in the, in the back of the room. It's not just the awesome rubber ducks. Um, it's the fact that we're meeting people where they are so that they can be of service. And um, I'll digress a little bit about my own background and, and my journey into government. Had you asked me two years ago, would I be working in the federal government um, at this time in this administration, you know, I would have been like, no, flipping way, that's crazy. Um, I'd been in the private sector my, my whole life, but when my country asked me to bring really practical skills that I had driving transformational change, using technology to connect to human missions, and my country asked me to serve, I couldn't think of a good reason why not to do it. You know, yeah, the, you know, what would people think of me for working in the government? Yeah, maybe the pay is not the best. But what is absolutely amazing is realizing that people across this country are working to make other American people's lives better, whether they're farmers or veterans or people working in FEMA. You know, these people I get to work with are fighting fires. They're rescuing people from floods and hurricanes. They're helping people deal with devastating crop devastation. They're helping keep veterans from committing suicide. And they're using technology to do this. So how we deliver services in government is how we deliver services in the private sector. It's a combination of people and technology. And we have to keep all of that safe and secure. So the more our mission is delivered, the more FEMA maps. Has anyone ever used a FEMA map? I had a floodplain in my backyard in um, Atlanta. And the survey, the paper survey that I had, I'm trying to sell the house if anyone's buying one. Um, <laughs> The, the, the survey information, the hard paper survey information about where the floodplain started um, was wrong. And so I, I've had a hard time selling my house because somebody wants to put a pool in the backyard, it says it's in the floodplain. But you look at the FEMA map and you can see, no, the floodplain's way the heck down the hill. You can tell that. We're making people's lives better. We're actually helping get people assistance after floods faster because we're using AI combined with some of these new tools, satellite imaging, FEMA mapping, to help figure out how bad the flooding is and do a lot of the qualification for uh, special uh, disaster recovery loans uh, after the fact. And so I'm here today because I believe the folks in this room are not only learning the skills we need to serve the broader missions, whether it's in government or in the private sector, um, whether it's in direct service um, to some of the missions I'm talking about or leveraging the tools that we provide. The work that you're doing and the studies you're embarking on are critically important to our country. It's part of where job growth in the future is going to come from as we evolve into the digital age. But I'd also like to tell you just one minute about uh, something we have in government that's under uh, me that maybe check out a little bit, learn a little bit more about. Um, so we have a program called the US Digital Service. They're a group of self-described geeks, geeks, 200 folks who are on term appointments in government, essentially doing technical firefighting. So the folks that saved healthcare.gov work for, for my team, and they go in if there's a cyber breach. There was a major breach um, of personnel data in, in the government in 2014. Um, 
millions of people who had worked for the government, including our veterans, including uh, military personnel, including uh, defense contractor, that information was exposed through a cyber attack basically because we had old systems and really bad hygiene when it came to the government. Our folks from the US Digital Services were on the ground going in to deal with that breach. This happens, I can't tell you about um, all the times or places it happens, but this happens like probably three or four times a year uh, where folks on our team, and the thing I wanna tell you about, I was telling the team about this last night, if you walk into Jackson Place, which is a historic building on Lafayette Square in Washington, D.C., it's, it's a 200-year-old townhouse where our U.S. Digital Service is based. It looks like a Silicon Alley, you know, New York City townhouse with a bunch of geeks in hoodies. They have stickers and they have flags and Star Wars paraphernalia. So you walk in there, it looks just like that. But these people are working on the missions I just talked about. The only thing that really is different is more than 50% of the people in that building are women. And a very large percentage of the people in that building are people of color, people from disadvantaged backgrounds, people from all over the country. And the reason they're there is mission. They're there because they want to serve. They're there despite the fact that the federal government does not pay as well as many of the lucrative places that they used to work and will work again. And they come for six months to two years to work on these critical areas of mission. And so what I wanna have you all think about is as you think about your careers in the cyber space, as you become part of the cyber workforce, give a thought to connections with government because we train more people in cyber through the military and through our civilian programs with those millions of work workers that are dealing with technology-driven missions. And we have some of the best missions. You know, Derek talked about his connections with government in terms of doing the mission. So, I'm looking forward to ongoing dialogues with BayPath and other community-based um, resources that are doing uh, the, the tough work, but also the agile work of responding to the needs of this time. You know, responding using educational methods and programs and delivery models, whether it's online or in the classroom, that meet the needs of today. And we're actually, uh, we announced uh, a couple months ago that we're actually trying to stand up a new way of looking at uh, connecting academia, the private sector, and government through something we're calling the GEAR Center, Government Effectiveness Advanced Research, uh, where we're looking at skilling issues. And I look forward to working on an ongoing basis with the folks here at BayPath and other community-based programs to help connect the skills and the learning with grants from the federal government, with resources from the private sector, so that we as a country can be more agile in building and developing those skills. So I could go on forever, I won't. I, uh, we're gonna have some Q&A in a little bit, but I thank you for what you're doing, and even if it, you don't feel like it, um, what you are doing is vitally important for our country. If you work in IT in general or cyber specifically, you are part of an ecosystem that is protecting our homelands and protecting vulnerable systems that are critical to running our schools, our hospitals, and our government. And just as you, know, you see how foreign actors are trying to attack us, they are attacking those things, and they're attacking us in our communities. Yes, they might attack Washington. Yes, they might um, attack Bagram Air Force Base um, outside of the country, but really where they're coming and where they're trying to divide us and make things difficult for us is in our communities. So you have a vital role to play in, in helping in that, in that fight and in that 
um, defensive posture. So I thank you for what you do. I thank um, Dr. Leary for having us. Um, I thank Tom um, and, and all of the folks here for having us. It's, it's been absolutely a, a, a real pleasure. So I'm going to turn it over to Tom. Margaret, that was amazing. And last night, we got into a lot of major issues in terms of things that are going on out there that they're working on, and it's awesome. They're trying to bring in um, a lot of uh, commercial uh, talent to help uh, the government to deal with a lot of the changes that have to take place. And last night's conversation was just fascinating. But thank you so much for encouraging folks to, to understand the great opportunities there are right now in terms of government employment in this space. And uh, I know that our career services group is very much tuned into that, and we appreciate your support in that regard. So wonderful. Um, we're going to get back into a little bit of technology again here with our final speaker. Um, how many of you um, had a um, memo the other day from the president? Uh, was that 218 the other day? Raise your hand if you, if you got the memo. Well, I'm about to introduce you to the pearl. Oops, see, hold, you, hold your hands up a second. I'm hold your hands up. To All right. I'm about, about to introduce you to the person who introduced the 220,000 of us together the other day. And uh, she came up with this idea about six months ago and, 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 and put it into effect. That's the federal government did something in six months of that nature. <laughs> Okay, that's impressive. So the person I'm about to introduce, Susan Kent, currently serves as the federal CIO at the Office of Management and Budget. Ms. Kent is an industry leader of large-scale business transformations using technology for the world's most complex organizations. She most recently served as a principal at EY and has been a partner at Accenture, consulting president at Carriker Corporation and a managing partner at J.P. Morgan. Although technology Change has been the core of her professional career. Retooling the workforce and creating new opportunities for people has been an essential element of efforts that she has led. She has served as an enterprise leader for organizational learning, diversity, and inclusiveness, and career development at every organization in which she has worked. Ms. Ken is a frequent speaker in global industry forums, publisher of thought leadership pieces, and holds patents in banking processes. Please welcome Suzanne Kent to this video. All right, am I on, gentlemen? All right, thank you. Good morning. And it wasn't actually, it wasn't my idea. It was a great, um, it was a great test from DHS, but I shared with some others um, that how fantastic is it that the federal government has realized the way to connect with the population is through mobile. And you know what? You can leave Margaret's slides up here if you don't mind because we're going to, sh we're sharing a little bit. And if you'll roll to this one. Perfect. All right, so glad to be here this morning. Um, like Margaret, I'm actually going to go really quickly because I think it's going to be exciting to hear your questions. As uh, I thank Dr. Leary and um, Tom for having us here. And it is so exciting to be the Federal Chief Information Officer at the time in the United States right now when we have a president who prioritizes technology change. And you see here, this is part of the agenda that, that Margaret is leading, IT modernization, data accountability, and transparency in workforce. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the top two, but, but they're all three critically important. That's why we represent them this way. It's also exciting that we have lawmakers in Congress who have a bipartisan commitment to advancing technology, and particularly cybersecurity. I know everyone has a intense focus every day, lots of things on your plate. You're probably not following all the legislation going on in Washington. But there's an unprecedented number of things about cybersecurity right now. I spend a lot of time on the Hill talking to our lawmakers around what we need to do. It is of vital importance. And um, you heard, I, I actually spent my entire career in financial services. I spent my entire career actually in industries protecting data. We focused on imaging checks. We focused on launching mobile applications. Um, I worked globally around supply chain risk. I worked with all types of technologies, data storage, how we become more efficient. And that's the reason that I'm here in the government. And I, I'm here in the government because I absolutely believe in the mission. And coming to Bay Path today, I, had to, I have to share one picture. When I, um, kind of like Margaret, when I got the call 
Um, I, I come from a family who is um, background military, and they had all served and had the opportunity to serve our country you know, with their lives. And this was something I could do. It's a battle that I could fight differently. And it's kind of, it's wonderful to be here at Bay Path because this was one of the headlines. First woman to serve. And so when I thought about that, and I thought about what we need in, in, and the fact that diverse teams deliver better results, and that what, yeah, <laughs> but diverse teams deliver better results, and that we need, we, you heard from Derek, you heard multiple times, we don't have enough people in the workforce, we don't have enough diversity in the workforce, and it never stops. Dr. Leary actually said something about your programs that really inspired me. They, we talked about it last night, but she said it this morning. And it's one of the things that I say to the federal workers. When we think about cybersecurity, our job is never done. Never done. I know the lawmakers, when they fund something, they think it's done when we get to the end of our spend, but it's never done. It is never done. And we always have to keep asking ourselves, what's next? What's next? Because when we address one thing, they move on to the next. And in the federal government, we're fighting multiple threat vectors, right? We, we, we do the simple things like in, when we talk about encryption, lost stolen devices, same thing that happens everywhere else. But who steals in the federal government is a little, little more tricky. Um, when we look at email phishing, those types of things, we're dealing with systems in the federal government. Some of them, one of the teams I'm working with right now, written in assembler 22 years ago, still supported by the same group of contractors. Same group. That's not resilient. That's harder to protect. That's something that we're aggressively trying to change. So when I got the call, and what I'd love to talk to you about, I want to kind of think about the, the things we've talked about this morning and face towards the future. Um, I'm here on this journey for two reasons. One, I think cybersecurity is the most important thing that we're doing now, and that we can do across our federal government. We have age systems, we have workforce um, that, that Margaret pointed out that we need to retrain, and we're not serving the citizens in the way that citizens want to be served. You, we, I, I, was, I was asking, looking around, around who received the alert, our goal was 75%, but our goal across every federal agency is to deliver services to Americans in the way that they expect. And, the, and what most Americans expect has been defined by their experiences in industry. All those questions Margaret asked you, whether, you, whether it's through banking, whether it's through ordering a car, whether it's through ordering food, whether it's checking the weather, those are the ways that Americans expect. Secure, fast, efficient. And those are the things that we're trying to drive across the federal government. And so we're driving them through commitments to IT modernization, native accountability and transparency, and investment in reskilling the workforce. And so, you know, blatant commercial, I'll go, I'm really blunt and to the point, so we're the federal government and we're hiring. <laughs> I, I uh, took a whole group of federal uh, CIOs and CISOs up to visit a big uh, corporation and look at their cybersecurity center, uh, their global cybersecurity center, and I'm talking to the head of cybersecurity, and so I said to him, tell me about how you recruit, tell me about where you get your workforce from. And you know what he said to me in front of all the, oh, we hire everyone from the government. <laughs> and it was really funny because the mission and what we do, and you actually heard from the other speakers here today and some of the bios that you read, what fantastic opportunities and experiences there are and what you learn so quickly. So cybersecurity, now, today, always, first reason that, that I am proud to serve our country. Second reason is the investment in the future, and that is data accountability and transparency. If we don't make the right investments now in our data infrastructure, and the federal government has the best data in the world, we are not going to be well positioned to take advantage of artificial intelligence, deep learning, advanced technologies, supercomputing. A couple of months ago, so I'm going to share a couple of stats, not necessarily as Cool bragging stats Dr. Leary shared, but a couple of things. Um, two months ago, the United States, through the Department of Energy, actually became the leader again in supercomputing. So 
number one again, we intend to stay there. Second thing, uh, two weeks ago, first time in 15 years, we launched a national cyber strategy again. A cyber strategy for the nation, the DOD and the nation on the same day. Yeah, if, you have not, if, you, if that's something that you're interested in, take a look at it, because it actually defines our priorities and our investments and the investments in technology going forward. And that's where our country is going, and those are some of the things that we are going to be working on and investing in. That creates opportunities for everyone in this room. The landscape is broad and diverse and exciting. And one of the things that I have the, um, the responsibility of leading as the federal CIO is all of the policy for how all of our federal agencies and our government uses technology. So one of the things that I'm doing passionately is updating all the policy. We had cloud technology policy we just released. Hadn't been updated in seven years. You heard this morning Derek talking about all the great things that we can do. No, who in this, I, I, this is an audience participation thing. I've done this in a couple of other groups. Who in here has the phone that you bought in 2008? Raise your hand. All right. Great example. <laughs> no one. So our policies and what we do and how we leverage technology in the government should, not, um, should, should be as timely and take advantage of all the things that are available on the commercial market um, and continue to ensure that we're at the forefront to deliver on mission, to deliver services that Americans ex expect, and for us to be great stewards of taxpayer money. We also know that maintaining those systems um, is very expensive. In the civilian side alone, we spend almost $80 billion, and we have 90,000 employees. 90,000 employees, $80 billion. 75% of that $80 billion is on legacy technology. That actually makes me very sad. <laughs> it makes me very sad when I go and talk to agencies. So when I talked about our lawmakers, they're doing some really interesting things to help us leverage working capital and other very interesting things so that we can have multi-year transformations. So as a person, I am, I am excited to be here because you are part of the future. And I am always privileged to be in rooms with teams like this who are doing very interesting things, bringing together people across all types of communities it, because we need to educate um, as we look at the workforce of the future and we look at where, where we are investing, all work, all work will have an element of technology. So being comfortable with technology, working in a technology enabled and potentially machine enabled environment where data is the most important thing that we're dealing with, that's what we're protecting, that's what we're understanding, and being a data driven government is actually going to help us make better decisions and serve the population better. You're part of that equation. Um, I'll, I'll share a couple of other interesting statistics. When um, One of the things that we also do, uh, I am part of the board of the geospatial committee across the federal government. 27 agencies, all that great geospatial data is not only contributed, it is made publicly available. That data generates 500,000 jobs and over a trillion dollars in economic value in the market. That's some of the things we want to do with data. We want to continue to stimulate the economy, we want to make better decisions, and we want to use that as the energy for, and, and the fuel for more advanced technology. So those are the top two priorities um, that, that I focus on. And with the workforce, one of the interesting things that we're learning is that you have to marry knowledge of the business processes with the technology skills. So that's the reason we talk about some of the programs, and that was part of the exciting conversation last night, is that learning never stops. Our most successful individuals in any profession are those who have committed to lifelong learning. And people who are in the technology and cyberspace, you know that better than anyone. Advanced problem solving, continuous learning, continuously asking what's next, and our educational systems have to support that. So we talk about what that looks like at elementary, what that looks like through um, community and um, four-year and advanced degree colleges. We also talk about what that looks like even while you're employed. It never stops. 
and for us to continue to be competitive and be number one in all the spaces that we aspire to lead in, we have to have that ongoing commitment. So that is the reason that it was a privilege to be here today. It's fantastic to talk to you and share the things that we're trying to do to drive the mission um, across the federal government. And as Margaret said, it is, it is so exciting to go out and be with farmers and you see the tractors and the tractors are, are, have you know, all these screens and they're talking about the soil depth and they're transmitting the acreage planted to the cloud. They're actually using cameras to look at where pesticides need to go so that we're only using those chemicals in the places that are needed. Talk to the war fighters and they're figuring out how to survey spaces and understand spaces so that we don't have to make risks with human life. Some of the exciting things Margaret mentioned, uh, we just celebrated some of the public service awards, service to uh, veterans in preventing suicide, solutions for Zika, um, someone who actually saw, identified, then solved, some of the autoimmune, treat, uh, came up with treatments, identified the disease, came up with the treatment um, in cycles. That's the mission. That's what we're trying to serve. Those are the things that we're trying to do. You know, the, some of the systems I talked about, Housing Urban Development, um, Department of Energy, protecting our national infrastructure, ensuring that looking at new and creative ways that we protect our wetlands, parks, and, and natural resources that are part of the Department of Interior. Those are the exciting things that we do. And then in every single one of those spaces, we fight a cyber bad actor. Almost all those spaces. So I, I thank you for being here, letting us talk to you a little bit. We're really looking forward to your questions. Um, your part, at Margaret, Margaret said it, but I'm going to echo it. You're part of how we stay leaders, how we protect our economy, how we grow our economy, and how we protect the, one of our most important natural resources, which is the data of all the American people. So thank you, sir. So we're going to have our speakers. Thank you so much. And our speakers are willing to stay a little bit longer if you can. And I know not everybody can. But we're going to have a question and answer period where we have microphones that will be circulating. Uh, those of you who have microphones, could you hold them up so we can see where you are? Okay, so they're in the back. Okay, so if you have a question uh, that you want to ask any one of the speakers, um, we welcome you to do that. And uh, before we get started on the questions, I just want to thank you all those, for our speakers. From the technology perspective that Derek gave us in the front end, which gives us a depth of what's available and what our students are learning about, we wanted to share that with our, with our audience, especially for students from other schools as well, so you understand what's going on. Um, the other thing that's really important is for our employers to understand, we have many, many students that are going to be graduating or, or, or in school right now or graduating, they need internships. And we have a table set up <laughs> in the back. If you think you would like an intern, we'd really like you to stop by and just sign up for, for an intern. And we have many uh, students that, that are looking for those opportunities to make that leap to get into uh, cybersecurity. And they can, maybe we can start by helping you to take a look at, at what's going on in your organization. So if we could, we're going to open it up now to questions from the floor. They got it down. It was like, I felt like I was being. Uh, thank you to the STEAM panel for presenting. That was very interesting. Uh, my name's Rob. I'm a cybersecurity major at, at STIC, underneath a wonderful program there. And at the um, that the possibility of being self-serving, I'm wondering if there are any any programs specifically for student loan forgiveness <laughs> for cybersecurity <laughs> majors with the United States government. I mean, yeah. self-serving. I am very interested in that. And again, thank you for your time today. Yeah. yeah so, um, uh, thank you for the question. And it, it's appropriate. I mean, being self-serving 
if you're also thinking about, so, I mean, like nothing wrong with that. <laughs> and and uh, one of the things, so the, the diagram Suzette had up there is from something called the President's Management Agenda, where when, when we looked at, at a lot of the seemingly obvious challenges of driving the mission of government in the 21st century with outdated technology, insufficient fiscal resources, you know, competing priorities. We saw the interconnection of these things as critical. And the connection of IT to people was actually kind of an aha moment for folks in the government. It's pretty obvious to folks outside the government <laughs> that you need to think about, OK, how do I attract the workforce? And we have a pretty outdated um, uh, civil service system that's in place for very good reasons. But we've identified um, a number of challenges, both in the law and how we implement the law, that are barriers to us getting the good people into government. So we're actually going to be announcing a number of things in the coming months, including um, starting next week, uh, which is the uh, 40th anniversary of Civil Service uh, Reform Act, the last time we really changed how we did hiring in government. So there'll be some announcements coming. So I can't answer your specific question yet, but it's on the radar because compensation comes in many forms. Loan forgiveness is a powerful one. Salary is important. But we believe mission and the mobility to serve mission, even if it's for a short period of time, is also a form of compensation. And so we're looking at all of these things and trying to tackle them in an in interconnected way. And if you're interested, this is a plug for my, my self-serving plug. We have, <laughs> we have a website called performance.gov where a lot of the things Suzette and I have talked about today are online. And we have a cross-agency goal around cyber workforce issues that you know, we'd encourage you to take a look at. Um, and as we do announcements, you can also uh, follow the Twitter feed from there. Um, you can also, we both have Twitter handles. Um, I just tweeted something, so those of you following this event can see that. But I'm Weikert45, um, Suzette, Suzette Kent45. Suzette <laughs> Kent um, and so stay tuned. But also, user-centered design is something we're trying to introduce to government. So being informed by your questions is something we want the government to get some discipline at. So throw us your ideas, throw us your input. I'm going to add two quick things. If you look at the National Cybersecurity Strategy, the back part of it is a commitment to workforce ongoing. And so it actually lays out competitive pay and commitment to ongoing education. So that's not only towards the question you asked, but also there are agencies who are making commitments to ongoing, at supporting ongoing educational pursuits of individuals who come in in the technology um, professional area and particularly cybersecurity. So as Margaret said, more details around those programs will be coming out, but it's the first time that's actually been a national commitment and part of the strategy. If I can add too, um, from the private sector, one of the things that we've been pushing for when we're hiring people, and we're in the Bay Area, it's an incredibly competitive job market, right? I'm dealing with Apple, Google, Cisco, all these companies in, in my backyard. And it's, it's particularly difficult for us to, to recruit there. So we've been going more outside the Bay Area, uh, Virginia, around DC, because there are a lot of great people who have also been trained in the government. Um, now we're, you know, we're hiring in, in New Orleans and, and Austin and places like that. I'll help you recruit yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we've been finding some great technolo technologists there. But one of the things to emphasize too, if you don't sort of go to government route, when you sort of negotiate your salary, <laughs> think also about potentially about that signing bonus going towards that loan, right? Because it, 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 there, a lot of people are, especially in the Bay Area, are really negotiating that, that entry point. And they had that flexibility because there are so many people hiring right now that, um, you know, in some ways you can kind of write your own ticket. So one of the things to think about is that, you know, you could probably put a big chunk of 
potentially a signing bonus or even or even negotiate something further with your employer with uh, further education where they're handling it too. Next question. Hey Tom, while you're looking yes. for questions, I forgot to tell Derek. Um, we actually are doing the census via mobile this year. So when you said it sounds like a, it will be done via mobile uh, this great. year, and so um, when you when you fill out your census, think about that. I, I was thinking about this last night. Imagine, like, I spent a lot of time looking at cell phone towers, right, doing forensics. The, looking at that data coming back of how many went out, how many got it, it's amazing big data this yes. applies so well to things like the census. Yes, yes sir. Uh, I'm, my name's Austin. Uh, I'm an employee at Paragus IT and also a cybersecurity major at Champlain College. Um, this is a question for Derek specifically. With APFS, what is the technology and the process looking like now that sort of traditional forensic imaging of drives is no longer possible? Um, as someone who just spent you know, a semester really grinding on forensic imaging of drives, finding out that that technology is rapidly sort of going into the sunset, um, what are some of the opportunities for research or development of new technologies there? It's a great question. Uh, I did a presentation about two, two weeks ago in, uh, in Salt Lake City, and people were almost depressed after my presentation because <laughs> the, the news sounded so bad. But it is, um, on the research side, it is a really fascinating point right now because there is so much opportunity to spend time, especially when APFS is a brand new file system, um, a lot of people spend a lot of time reverse engineering it. And um, we got maybe 95% of it right. And, and when Apple released a specification for it, uh, we got some good validation, which was great. But we worked on that for almost a year before the spec, the spec came out. And reverse engineering a file system is interesting. You can, what we typically do is you know, get a little thumb drive, tiny little thumb drive, format it, and then add one file, and then image it, and then add another file, image it again, to delete a file, image it again, and look at all the differences, look at all the deltas, right? But because now all that encryption is going on, there are keys associated to decrypt it. You just have to sort of figure out those steps of how it's done. It's a bit like a Russian doll. It's a doll within a doll within a doll, you know, like a whole series of keys. So there, there, there's fantastic opportunities for research, and, and it's, it is ripe also because, um, especially on the Apple side, because they have been so uh, not open source, you know, a lot of people have been spending quite a bit of time and money and resources to do that reverse engineering. Uh, just because it's not as open, let's say, as uh, Android and Linux and stuff like that, where you can get into the guts of that operating system, whereas you can't do that on a Mac. So, um, you know, when the, some of the tools come out, these exploits come out, and it gives you access to it, th those are the perfect situations. And I'm not going to advocate to everyone go out and jailbreak your phone <laughs> because you're basically removing all the security from it, or make sure you're doing it with a test phone. But it's, that's how you learn what you're dealing with and then what you're potentially going to be, be able to contribute later on. I'm looking to the people right now that are doing forensics, and one of the things I was hoping to maybe stimulate with the conversation was to basically have some of the young people that are, are, are going to be coming out of classes right now and start having you think about these are some really interesting fields to take, to take a look at. And we, you know, um, there's going to be new devices. There's always going to be something new coming out. One of the other areas I find unbelievably fascinating, I, I talk about mobile forensics. The true mobile forensics are cars, right? Cars are tied to the internet, right? And uh, it is amazing. Uh, I did some research about a year ago, and I did, you may, may be familiar with a company called Burla. They do vehicle forensics. And I, I gave up my car, and they did forensics on my car. It's a very humbling experience, right? Because then you have students coming up to you and say, oh, I see you listen to, you listen to the comedy channel on Sirius Radio. 
And it's very strange to have you have people talk to you about what your car is telling about you. And it's another fascinating area because all this self-driving stuff, and you've probably heard many rumors of Apple that are potentially doing stuff in that space, all this stuff applies to that. So it is, um, when it comes to a, a, a file system like NTFS that was used by, by Windows like forever, right? You know, it's, it's very much defined and pretty much people have figured it out. When you have a brand new file system, I get excited and it's like, this is something I can dig into. That was a long answer, but. <laughs> well, I, th I think you're right too. The, the way that we've all been taught physical acquisition, physical analysis, but now the hard drives are too large, the encryption is too hard. Now, that, now we're looking more logical imaging, um, targeted collections. Perhaps a lot of the times you're only looking at the user profile of the suspect. You don't need all that un unallocated space. So I think a lot of it has to do with just the changing of the times. As these drives just continue to get bigger and bigger, terabytes upon terabytes, um, the return on investment is not there to do the bit for bit digital fingerprint copy that we've all been trained. And that's kind of how everything's changing. We just have to change with the times. So. And as one add additional part about that, when we're doing imaging too, a lot of it was also to potentially get that unallocated area to go after files that are deleted. Well, now with all that encryption going on, it's pretty much, it, there's not a lot of deleted files anymore, right? So yeah, there, no, there is yeah, some content, yeah, yeah. but because the encryption still stays there, when the files get deleted, the files are left in an encrypted state. So before you could potentially tie a potentially a key to a specific file and decrypt it. But when it's, once that key goes away and the file has been deleted but it's still left there in an encrypted state, you're spending a lot of time imaging an entire drive where maybe 25% of the data is the active files. So imaging is still viable to a point, but also I think we have to be more efficient in doing things like triage and doing logical collections because there's no bang for the buck for basically going after deleted files because you, you most likely will not get them. The same thing, when you think about it with iOS devices, the same thing happened with iOS devices. Over time, you weren't de getting deleted files from iOS devices, and the same thing is happening with, with Macs and, and potentially with Windows with more and more encryption. So now where you potentially, it, it, you're spending a lot of time imaging a very big drive where it's pr you're potentially better suited to potentially go after logical files. A good case for Dr. Leary's point of continuing to update the curriculum. <laughs> Next question up here. <laughs> With so much innovation being driven by big data, do you guys see laws like GDPR as actually decreasing the competitive advantage of the UK? And therefore, if laws like that continue to get pushed in the US, that it decreases our competitive advantage compared to countries where data is more liberal and more available? So I think I'll, I'll, Suzette will have a lot of thoughts on this. I, I'll just say quickly, we, we had this conversation last night. Um, it, structured, unstructured data, you know, there are dif different paths to identifying that. But I would say user-centered design and thinking about the human element and having the right hypotheses and having the test and learn processes and capabilities are actually the things that will drive sustainable competitive advantage in the future because how sustainable is sustainable? It, when it's tech, it's a tech arms race. You're always you know, coming up with new tools, new capabilities. The things that we in the private sector believe are giving sustainable competitive advantage have to do with business processes, cultures, you know, innovative capabilities. And that's the place where I think open systems are very helpful. Um, I think GDPR is almost more a, a symptom of a framework in Europe that is more closed and much more top-down co control oriented. And I frankly would bet on the chaos and unstructuredness of the US system. You know, it, we need quantum computing, we need to win in supercomputing, but at the end of the day, the, my take is the laws aren't going to be the end all, um, and I, I think it would be harder for some of that to come in here, but even if it does come in here, I'm not, I'm not afraid. No, and we, we've, we've had, right there, there's kind of 
two forces that we're balancing, the commitment to open data and things, you know, I, I share the geospatial example of we know we stimulate the economy. You know, um, commerce puts out a terabyte of data a day, a day. And people would be very interested in doing something with that data. So there's there's one side that is open. There's the other side that is a a, um, a requirement and a mandate for fierce protection of privacy. And in between, it is where the the robust debate is going on. And GDPR is an indication of that. Is what is personal information? And what am I when I submit something? What am I actually giving you the rights to use or the license to use? And there, there are many examples where a, a piece of data in itself, so we talked about geospatial. If I tell you about the wind and the waves and the temperature, nobody, everybody's like, that's great. There's no, but there's no conflict. But if I say we're going to do that same thing with healthcare information, there's a reaction. And so what is the mechanism with which we, we provide open data, but we fiercely protect privacy? And GDPR is kind of a stab at that. California actually has passed a law, and they're in discussion about how that might be implemented that has some of the same things with GDPR. But that actually creates the, 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 the way that those are set up. The intent is to protect privacy, but the implementation of those actually creates other types of restrictions that could have implications on what happens not only with the economy, but we, as we talked about, if, if a life is at risk or other things, what you can actually do. So the what we see going on legally is that negotiation in between the, the spaces of protection of the right information, but providing open data where it is of benefit to the public. And I think the debate is going to continue, and it is very heated right now around spaces of artificial intelligence. So it's, that's a, it's, a, it's a great question, something to continue to watch. But it's also incumbent on this community to have a perspective about actual technology and policy and approaches that we can take and, and, and can be part of you know, matching some of the um, human element into technology yeah. of what is the right thing to make the data available but how we ensure individual privacy in the use. Yeah, and I think that human element is actually the most important thing. So regardless of the laws, if there's a convenience factor for humans, they may choose to give up privacy. But if they don't know, and Facebook knows this very well, if they don't really know how it works or if it's really hard to kind of control, then we get these like one size fits all you know, big giant walls on the data. But what most people want is configurable, easy to fit, you know, like I don't like the temperature in my apartment the same as my 17-year-old boy. Um, but I have a control for that. And since I pay the bills, I have a little more control <laughs> than he does. But, you know, that's kind of the nature. And if, if, if innovation can help us deal with that and, and find uses for metadata that separates out personally identifiable um, information from information that might be useful to large populations, you know, I think that's a, a, an area where we'll lead the world. I had this, uh, for, for the longest time when I was doing investigations at Apple, whenever we had to do an investigation in Europe, it was always a mess. It was, it, it was so difficult dealing, and this was years ago, be, long before GDPR, and, and we're dealing with you know, cases in Germany or France or things like that where it was, it was pretty much impossible to fire someone based on an investigation for uh, you know, what, whatever an HR matter or something like that because there was, there was so much protection. And there was always this question of who owns the data, who owns the data. I was talking earlier about iCloud. To me, it's fascinating with Apple because on top of all that data sitting on Apple servers, iCloud, it's actually hosted by Google. So who owns the data, right? Where is the actual data? In the, in the past, when we'd write a search warrant, you know, you're basically writing on an address and you're going after a physical place, right? But if you go after data at Apple, 
and did a search warrant, but the data is sitting at Google. Who actually owns the data? It's a, it's, it's a fascinating area. And that's why also when all these different servers that sit around all around the world, that, you know, they, they've actually been trying for a long time to potentially move data centers into those geo areas so that they wouldn't have the privacy issues. You know. and, and another big one that you probably just heard about recently, all the stuff that's going on in China with Apple, right? Because they're going to, China has some of those new security laws where basically the data has to stay inside the country, uh, which is almost an extreme version of GDPR, if you ask me. It, there's also, um, if, if anyone's interested, some of the industries that are ahead, um, and Margaret and I both worked in financial services, so I have an affinity there, but there, there's actually, emerging perspectives as well as fields of study around ethical AI and ethical use of data. And it, that it's actually exploring and, and using frameworks around these same questions. And um, there's actually a couple of podcasts from different institutions about how they're looking at that. And um, a, a one institution actually just announced a couple, about two months ago, a major in that, which is, which is really in interesting, right? That's another indication how critical data is gonna be in the foundation of what we do going forward and the recognition that we have to, ma we have to marry the human element to how we can leverage technology. How about students? Any, yeah. any students? There, we go. there you go, yay. Microphone right behind you. Points for bravery. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ben Schiff. I'm an IT major at Western New England University. Uh, so my question is kind of specific uh, for you, Suzette. So uh, this past summer, I did some IT security work as an intern for the company who's actually working on the software for the government census. Uh, can you give me any insight onto how that's going? I may be potentially <laughs> considering an offer from them. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there are multiple companies, but I can guess based on your location who that might be. Um, we're, you, we are actually doing some pretty um, effective tests. There was actually just a testimony to Congress around the readiness for that. Um, and one interesting thing that we found, and you know, maybe this would be an area where you can um, contribute, is because it is mobile, we have some areas that are not sufficiently served by, by you know, mobile broadband. And so we're looking at how we actually have to, to supplement with field agents and the traditional methods in some of those areas. And so we're actually looking a little bit more broadly so with um, Department of Education and some other areas of, are there pockets of the United States when we're making these investments in mobile and digital services that we can't get to because of the infrastructure in those areas? So. Um, not only is it exciting, I, I smile because I am personally involved in that because the, the infrastructure that they're creating and the method to reach American citizens is something that we're looking at across multiple agencies that have significant field agent footprints. So Small Business Association, the um, USDA and what they have to do to reach rural farmers and things like that, the approach that they're using has applicability in some of those other areas. So that, that might mean that there's uh, other things that will be coming after that uh, across the federal government. Yeah, and the US Digital Service, um, there, there were some um, uh, reports that. about some of the pilots this summer um, that weren't super complimentary, but the US Digital Service has recently gotten involved. So our group of geeks that we talked about um, to work with uh, the Census Bureau and Department of Commerce broadly on that. So I think it would be cool yeah. if you took a job with, me, <laughs> with those guys. And they did do all the piloting in the Northeast as well. Yeah, Providence. The security implications of all that data is mind-boggling, <laughs> right? But we opened that data up. So, I mean, that's another example where, you know, we just don't have it structured in a way that's easy to get to today. It's not user friendly, but it's available. So if you're a criminal enterprise, you got that data. Like, it's, it, we don't need to hide it. We need to make Americans be able to get benefit from that data. Right now, today, if anybody's curious, go to data.gov. There's more than 200,000 data sets. 
that the federal government makes publicly available And she's today. cleaning it up. Right now. Well, we are cleaning it up. Some of it, I don't know what you do with it, but it, it is out there. It's publicly available, and one of the efforts under the Data Accountability and Transparency Cap goal is we're looking at how we actually make that more usable, more impactful, um, and more linked, but it's available today. Well, we're going to wrap up now, and we really want to thank our speakers for being so generous with your time. Thank you.